Welcome back to Pipeline Profits, the podcast where we dig deep on everything sales and marketing, and we show you how you may be able to leverage it in real estate. And this week, we've got something awesome for you from a marketing standpoint, and I'm excited to dig in and figure out you know, how everybody can leverage the bright mind that we have here today and all the information that they're going to share. Yeah, so today's guest is an absolute all-star. I'm super excited because this is actually going to be slightly different, like a slightly different conversation than what we typically talk about, Ryan. Like we're usually like so online focused and client acquisition. And for those of you guys, there's a lot of you guys in our community that really focus on repeat referral and client experience. And if there's anybody that we can have on the show to talk about how to deliver the most kick-ass client experience, it's the guest that we have today. So this guest started working in uh, corporate America for Fortune 500 companies and decided to jump ship, start his own company that focuses exclusively on ensuring that your clients have an unbelievable experience with you. Um, he is a top ranked strategy consultant. Um, he has an MBA from Duke. He is, I think the most important part of him, an awesome dog dad, but he is the founder of the custom box agency, my good friend, Mark Stern. Welcome to the show, man. I love this, Emma. It's so good seeing you. So I'm excited about this. Let's have some fun. We, um, so listen, you, your company, like when I first met you, I was absolutely kind of like mind blown with what you do um, because you tie so many important facets about a customer experience together. So I'm gonna let you, before I butcher what you do, uh, I'm gonna let you kind of take the reins right. and like let our audience know what it is that you do and like what makes you special because you really are special and like kind of a, a unique category king in and of yourself. Oh, I love this. I love, I mean, I just need to show up to this every day. This is amazing. <laughs> um, so I am Mark Stern from, I live in Austin, Texas. Um, so my business is Custom Box Agency. And I think people instantly, when they think box, they're instantly going to go to swag box. And um, we're not in the business of swag. We joke and say swag means stuff without a goal. Um, so we don't want more stuff. We want like intentionality. And so when we're talking about customer experience, the anchor that I want to anchor you all on who are listening is, we try and keep things very simple. And if you look at your customer life cycle, you acquire a customer, then you deliver your products and services, and then you want to retain them. So this idea of there's three different buckets when we work with clients and we're trying to optimize um, that customer journey and optimize the experience around the journey. The first question we say is, what is your objective? Is it acquisition to increase visibility and acquire clients? Or is it the next phase? Delivery, onboarding all the way to getting them the desired outcome as to why they're working with you in the first place, or is it retention? Retention typically is heavily on recognition. I see you, I wanna celebrate you, all the way to put the strategies in place to extend customer lifetime value. So we try and keep it simple in that sense is there's so many things that you can do that when you optimize customer journey and you know how people are navigating through your products, there's so much that we can do. We can gamify it and incentivize behavior we can introduce expansion packs or new products and services to serve them at a higher level. Um, we can see where people are getting stuck with your process and to try to get them unstuck. We can build sales collateral that feeds through all el elements of the process. Like there's just so much you can do that so many people, like the question that we like to answer is do you truly know what you're asking your customers to do? Because just the insights associated with that can unlock so much uh, potential for your business. So that's what a lot we look at. Box for us is when we understand that journey, we reinforce it with something physical. And it's not just box as a standalone. It's about marrying the digital realm with the physical realm um, to bring those elements together in a really powerful way. But how did you get to this, po this point? Yeah, that was my question. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you didn't wake up one day and you're like, uh, I'm just going to do a custom box agency. Like, how did you get from, you know, corporate America to running this awesome company? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a story. So um, I, I, I'm happy to run through it, but it like kicked off. I was like the, the poster child of corporate America, like poster child of like, here's like the way to live a happy life. I grew up in Alabama and um, 
we were everyone that I knew was just like me. And it was you go to high school, you graduate high school, go to college, graduate college, get the job, then go back to grad school and then get the dream job. And it's white picket fences and happily ever after. And um, I did it to a T. I was president of my high school, my college and my grad school. I had the one dream job before grad school and the one job after because I just go all in on anything that I do. And you flash forward, I graduated Duke in 2012. Um, uh, we were the class that enrolled right after the economic burst of 2008. So like when like people lost their jobs and they started going back to school, um, I was $165,000 in student loan debt in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just signed a contract with Deloitte, which if you work with a big tech company, a big consulting firm by contract, you sign away anything you produce as ownership to the firm. So when people start talking about a side hustle, my side hustle is property of Deloitte. Everything I did was property of Deloitte. That was a way that they protected themselves. So imagine having these like golden shackles of a good salary and this contract that allowed you not to explore your entrepreneurial spirit and then $165,000 in student loan debt. It was this burden that this idea of becoming an entrepreneur, to me, what it felt like the most irresponsible thing I could ever do in my life. And um, I had this low moment in 2013. I was working really hard. Um, and if you know corporate American, you know consulting, you're a road warrior. Every Monday at 4.45, Cap picks you up, you go to an airport, you're living in airplanes, you're staying in hotels every day of the week. Um, and I did that for six years. But um, had this moment that you kind of pause and look at life and go, is this what life is made of? I have nothing to look forward to in my life because all I do is work. And when you have that low of a low moment, um, I had found just by navigating YouTube, this conference that Mind Valley. I don't know if you've heard of Mind Valley. Yeah. Yep. They have a conference that's called A-Fest. At the time, it was called Awesomeness Fest. <laughs> which is like, I think they changed it to A-Fest because awesomeness, I don't think resonated with a lot of people. But I went and it was this like mix of TED Talk speakers meet Burning Man parties. And um, I was like, this is the coolest thing. I want to go to this and reach out to a bunch of friends. Um, none of them, all of them were like, that looks awesome. Let's do it. Let's do it. But when push came to shove, none of them did it. And I was like, I need something to look forward to. So this was... May 2013. The event was in November 2013. I signed up for it. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no clue who was going to be there. I didn't know anyone. And it was uh, such a pivotal point in my life because when I showed up, um, it introduced me to the world of digital marketing. Um, They did this event that like all these big names in digital marketing, Andre Chaperone, uh, Noah Kagan of AppSumo, Yannick Silver of... um, Oh my gosh, it's fleeting my mind. Yannick Silver runs the Maverick Group. Um, All these big name um, digital marketers were there. And I was like, I had no idea what was going on. Um, But I left this event thinking the world that I lived in, this corporate America world that I thought I was crushing it in, um, got exposed to this new realm that I could live life on my own terms and um, still be fulfilled, but it was unlike anything that I'd been exposed to. So that started this journey that it took me from 2013 to 2018 um, of just like literally buying every digital marketing product, going to traffic and conversion, going to funnel hacking live, being a fly on the wall until you finally realize that I'm doing all of this because it's like a panacea, a medicine. I'm not diagnosing what's really going on here, which is um, corporate America is not my journey. And um, like once I realized that um, had this moment at the end of 2017, so it was like Christmas 2017 that um, went to bed and just had this premonition. If I stay in this corporate job, um, it would kill me. And that spooked me enough in a way that I came back on. Man, I remember it vividly. It was January 3rd, 2018, and sat down with the partner that I reported to at Deloitte and told him, I can't explain it, but um, I got to go. And I was on the verge of becoming a junior partner, and I had no idea what I was going to do. But like, I felt the calling, and I knew, and I, I think this is important, if I could just release the mental capacity that was my corporate job, I could eventually free up the space to get creative again and figure out what the thing was. 
So that was kind of the catalyst of what made me leave corporate America. And to your question about custom box agency, how that came, it was never meant to be the business. The business was um, out of the gates. The first thing I did was a virtual summit um, because I was like, this is so cool. Someone told me about it. I can have my own conference. I can interview people. It produces content and generates leads um, and all these things. Uh, no one told me how overwhelming a summit is to put on. And someone was like, yeah, you want like 40 or you want 30 speakers. And of course I had 43 speakers on the summit. But um, what I did, and I actually have it here, is the thing that kind of bothered me about the summit was it's so much digital content you're dumping on your people. 40 plus interviews. Like if I truly want to help people, sending them 40 plus interviews isn't really helping them. And so I turned all the interviews into a publication that's called Entrepreneur Elements. This was the publication from that event. Um, and we shipped it out to everyone who purchased a ticket to the summit not knowing what would happen. And all the speakers would like open up their page and show off their, their spread. It edified them in a really powerful way. Um, recipients would get it, take pictures with it. So I was getting all this organic traffic and it kind of introduced this idea that in this digital age, we're so heavily digital, just by combining something physical provided a new opportunity. And then um, when I did my next summit, I didn't do 40 people, I did 10 people. It was called High Ticket Online. And we did the same thing, but we did a box experience. And again, all the speakers showed off the box because it had them featured in it. It edified them as high ticket experts. And then the recipients started doing it. And that just started this spiral of, um, how are you doing these boxes? Um, you know, How are you creating this? And the amount of organic traffic, it just made it a no brainer of, Anytime you do something digital, tie it with something physical. And by bringing those two worlds together, you amplify your business in a way that is, is really powerful. So that's kind of where it all got started. I love it. Oh. Um, I, sorry, Ryan, I got one quick question about this, this uh, initial book that you sent, okay? Yeah. Um, so you did the summit first, the first year, and then this, you were like, okay, that summit was a little bit too overwhelming. So the second year I pared it down, I put together the book and I sent the book out. Was the book sent before the summit or was it a synopsis after the summit? Cause you said that the, the speakers were holding it. So I'm just trying to like bookend it in my mind as to when that physical experience yeah. happened. Cool thing about summits is in the classic model of the summit, um, the book, like you pre-interview everyone. So then you can repurpose the content beforehand. So for the okay. speakers, I wanted them to all get it before the summit. One of the things that we did was really, really cool was we turned all the speakers into trading cards. So every speaker had their own trading card and on the back of the trading card almost had the cheat sheet to their, their talk and Very how cool. they structure their high ticket programs. And that one little thing created so much buzz that um, everyone wanted to show off their trading card. And I think in that summit, uh, all but one person that was a speaker on it, like promoted it. And if you know, if you've ever hosted a summit, it's hard to get your people to promote the summit when Absolutely. you edify them. Uh, the other thing that we did that was really powerful was I knew my numbers, and this is the importance of knowing your numbers. For that summit, I told all my speakers, um, for every ticket that they sold of the summit, they received 100% of the affiliate commission. So wow. it was $100 for the box set, they got all $100, but they didn't get the bump and the OTO. But knowing my bump percentages, it didn't matter in the cost of the box and shipping. Um, we were still profitable, even if they got 100% of the commission for just the ticket sale. So, well, okay. And then just for our audience, cause our, our, our audiences are, are real estate agents. So awesome. bump an OTO to them. They're like, I don't know what that is. They're like, yeah. I'm just trying to get some leads here. So can you explain to our audience what a bump is and what an OTO is? Imagine you have a core offer that you're selling and you have this offer. So for me, in the example of the summit, it's selling a ticket to the virtual summit. A bump, when you are on your checkout page, there could be a little checkbox that says, would you like to add on this element? Some people describe the bump as, imagine going to the grocery store and you're at the checkout and there's the gum and the candy bars and all those things and the um, Cokes and the different beverages that you just grab. It's just that like last minute thing that increases the value of your cart when you're checking out. Um, and with a good bump, what you wanna see is typically about a 30% take rate. Um, for a lot of our bumps, we usually would see a 50 to 80% take rate. 
So the offer is so good and the bump is right there that they buy the ticket to the event. But this little add on offer that we're putting there, it's just a checkbox. So that's the bump. Um, the idea of an OTO is after you complete the purchase of the ticket, whether or not you took the bump, there may be a second offer that's the next thing to help serve you. So I may hit you with another option that says, all you need to do is click this button and we'll also add this other element to it. So it could be a workshop, it could be um, additional supporting materials, but usually it's a complimentary thing, the next thing they need um, that becomes a no brainer that they're like, oh, I have this. You know, For some people it may be, hey, you bought a ticket to my virtual event, the, the upsell or the OTO, one-time offer is what that stands for. It could be, would you like me to send you a workbook that gives you everything you need uh, to support the virtual event that you're about to go through? And so it just becomes another element that increases the cost of the cart. I hope that made sense. A hundred percent that made sense. Yeah. And so what you were saying with your um, with your speakers, you you knew that on the back end, your bump offer and your one time uh, and your OTO, so your one time offer, your take rate for those were so high that it still made sense for you just to give a hundred percent of the commission of the actual ticket back to the speakers. And what that ended up doing was encouraging them to share your event even further because they were financially incentivized to sell the event. Exactly. And the other yeah. thing it did was because they were featured on the box. Um, I was going to say, if I was upstairs, I would show you the actual, like, this is like box zero. This is like ground zero for custom box <laughs> agency. Um, and I did Before not expect it to this much detail for the virtual event. Uh, but um, the coolest thing about it was that it, it qualified them. So you find ways to say, how do I like up level a partner? And if I give them a way of saying, hey, it's one thing to say, hey, I'm awesome. It's another thing to be like, oh my gosh, look at this box. It's all about high ticket selling that I was featured in. So it's edifying them and qualifying them in a really powerful way, but it doesn't really have to cost you a lot of money. And they love to show off things that are gonna up level their status. So that was the other thing. The other thing is just helping them think through strategy. And some of them had their own products and services that were priced at the same price point. So imagine them saying, hey, buy this $100 ticket to this virtual event and you'll get access to my program for free that's priced at the same rate. So they can then bundle their offers and it enhances the quality of their own products and services. Because um, I had one of my speakers, Eileen Wilder, I don't know if you've ever come across her. She's great with high ticket sales. She's amazing. But she said, like, I require all my people to buy that, because, which ultimately gave uh, was a win for me, but it was a double win for them because they were already spending $100 for one of her products. Yep. Now they get this extra box. It's all about high ticket sales, like reinforcing that she's a good influencer that's tied to it. So it's also being creative about how this becomes a win win, not only for me, but for them as well. And that's a big miss with a lot of virtual summits is that <laughs> it's only about like, hey, I just want to interview you so you can send out emails to promote me. There's not really truly thinking about the strategy of like a true win win for both parties uh, that are involved, because if it's a win for them, they're going to want to talk about it. That's that's so smart. Did you I want to go back because, yeah. you know, your stories, your story is like very different than a lot of entrepreneurs. Like you started, go, like you went to Mind Valley in 2013 and it took you like another five to six years to finally say, I'm, I'm done with the corporate life and I want to be an entrepreneur. Whereas the usual story is they go to one event and they're like, oh, this changed my life and I'm, I'm now an entrepreneur. Um, so my first question is what, why were you so committed to continue to educate yourself in a different way while still being in that corporate world, right? Where you were probably contributing a lot of what you were learning that you were spending your own money on to be better for your clients at Deloitte, right? So why do you think you continued on so long before finally making the jump? Yeah, there's a lot of things. One thing is mindset. So part of it is the risk associated with it. I think that early on, I'm just like, again, when I was that much in student loan debt, I thought that anything entrepreneur was one of the most irresponsible, stupidest things. Like that was the message in the story in my head. Um, yeah. And I wish I had known because the reality is the, the, when I became, when I went all in on entrepreneurship, I paid off my loans faster. And so loans are gone, but like, it's such a hard thing to believe that like just freeing up that clarity is really powerful. The other thing, that uh, kept me at Deloitte as long as it was, was uh, I actually had a great, great experience at Deloitte. I had amazing clients at Deloitte. Um, I was fulfilled, but every time in my mind, I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go. 
they knew the tactic to like cast the fishing pole back in and pull me back in. Um, mm. And so every two years, like after two years at Deloitte, when the golden shackles, like now I can leave, I'm, I fulfilled my contract uh, contractual obligation. They put me in an amazing dream um, role doing a marketing transformation for a big retailer. And they gave me mentorship and all these things. And so I felt supported. And then when it hit year four and it was the same thing, you got to go, you got to go. This is a weird story, um, which I'm happy to share. But this is, um, I went to A-Fest, Valley's event. This is the second or third time. Vision literally stands on stage and he is like, I just went to this event from um, a guy named Peter Diamandis. It's this thing called XPRIZE Visioneers. And we got to set, and so for those of you who don't know what XPRIZE is, XPRIZE and Peter, Peter is like a, leading futurist thought leader he does bold crazy things he'd make some bold decisions in terms of like i mean he launched x prize which is all about incentive competition so all the conversations that we're having about spacex and privatizing space travel that's because of peter diamandis and he did this x prize competition that he said for anyone on earth like there's a needle in a haystack that can solve humanity's biggest problems um uh for the team that can build a, a rocket, go to space, land and take off again in two weeks later, um, you'll get a $10 million prize purse. So like all these teams can compete. Only one team gets the $10 million prize purse. He actually created this dramatic demonstration that he was like in front of NASA with a stage announcing it. He didn't have the $10 million. He knew that if he got the process started, he would figure it out. So he took a bold and audacious approach to business and this guy was like a hero of mine and vision at, at a fest is like i'm on his innovation board i just came back from this event where we got to determine the next event to impact a billion lives and sitting in the audience um i just had this like you like feel the energy and i was so inspired that i was like one day i want to do something so incredible that peter diamandis invites me to go to this x prize vision it was so clear to me and, um, you know, that was about the time that I was at four years in and about to leave. And then Deloitte, of course, announces a partnership with Peter Diamandis and XPRIZE and that they're looking for someone to run the project. And, um, you know, it was like one of those moments. It's like I was on this big transformation with a retailer. And if you're locked in a project, it's hard to roll out. Stars aligned in a way that like I went through the process. I was selected to go work with Peter and XPRIZE. And um, like, and I like the timing worked out for me to transition off my project perfectly. And I'm like, this is just too weird for like the universe to be like, in my head, I'm like, it's time to go. But the reality is um, like the universe needed me to stay to have this opportunity. And so that's what ultimately kept me there another two years. Cause I got to fly out weekly from Austin to LA to go into the XPRIZE offices and live in that world for two years. And that was like crazy, eerie, weird, awesome. I don't know how to, so that's what kept me. And then it was the second that ended the pool that kept on pulling me back. And then the premonition of the shop will kill you was enough to push me over to say it's time to go. So like, it was almost like you got to separate the head and the heart in a way, because when you try and think logically and justify your decisions, I say my head always steers me in the wrong direction, but my gut always steers me in the right direction. And so my head kept on saying, leave Deloitte. My heart said, no, there's something coming. And the second that the heart stopped pulling me back and said, now it's time, um, and was kind of giving me those cues. I'm not a woo person, but uh, like the more like I, I lean into just trusting my gut, um, I always have no regrets in terms of the path it takes me. So. What was the, what was the, like, it's so crazy to see it all come full circle, but also come full circle in a corporate environment is like yeah. even more strange. What was, so you spent two years going on that journey with Peter, going to the offices, doing the traveling. What was, like, what would you say your biggest takeaway was in those two years? The, the conversations that you have in that world make no sense anywhere else. Because they start like, <laughs> so like if you've ever heard of like, and it was, it's exactly what you said earlier, which is like, when I'm living in the corporate American world, we all talk the same talk. And mm -hmm. then there's this digital marketing online entrepreneurship world that people speak a very different language. So if I go to my like corporate friends and I'm like funnels and OTOs and bumps, 
they're going to be like, Mark is excited about something. I have no idea what he talks about because until <laughs> they're ready to embrace the other side, it is just garble that makes absolutely no sense. Right. And so now to add a third, you got the funnel land and entrepreneurship in the corporate world. And now you got the future of world. I mean, these are like, you're in these meetings that have conversations that are like, what if in the future you get to go into a facility to map out the genetic makeup of your child? You can choose the sex, the height, every element of who they are. And then, so you're like breaking down what this reality looks like in some of these conversations. And then they do a, like a twist that they're like, and now this new generation of people, um, they're adults and they're revolting because they didn't get to choose who they were. They were like selected for them. And now the superior race is revolting against the previous, like you're having these conversations or the whole like future of mobility. You are in an autonomous vehicle. What is life like now when you don't have to drive a car? Because driving a car is considered uh, archaic and dangerous. It's dangerous to drive a car. And then what happens if someone runs in front of your car? Like, who do we save? Do we save the person or do you, you know, fall off the mountain? So you're like having all these conversations that you start to take these conversations out to a different realm. And then they're just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So that was like, your brain hurts because our brain is limited. We're not computers. And you have these conversations that make no sense to anyone else in any other realm. Um, again and again and again, that's interesting. And it's fun to talk about, but it only works in a certain time and place. And so that's what it was like for two years was that we're talking about things that are so far in the future and it's all hypothetical. But the one thing, I think this was a linking quote that is like the best way to um, uh, predict the future is to create it um, or something to that effect, which is you're watching Star Trek, Star Wars, the Jetsons, all these shows that kind of depicted a, a, a vision of the future some of these items that were created as an afterthought in a cartoon or in a sci-fi show are the biggest inspirations for innovation to this day. And so that's kind of where it's like, you know, um, leaning on our past to say no one, it was inspired by something that someone just thought of, you know? I love it. I love it. And I, I mean, I figured it was going to be something to that effect of like, <laughs> you know, being able to like open your mind and see things in a different way or understand, you know, the possibilities or how other humans kind of think about the world, which is super interesting. Um, I, I want to go back to the summit thing for one quick, quick second, because um, you had kind of alluded to something and I know you're a strategist. So, and we're talking to real estate agents. So I was trying to, to pair this together, but you said like one of the most effective things when you were running the summit, having, you know, your speakers support the growth of the summit as well, which is one of the biggest challenges that most people have. It's like, Oh, if I'm going to have these speakers, I want them to promote it. It's like, you know, pulling teeth to try and get them to like do anything other than show up, do their thing and then leave. Right. And you had mentioned um, uh, edifying them and essentially, you know, um, putting them in a position to up level them and make them look good. And this was one of the things I was actually teaching on it yesterday, which is which is interesting is like for real estate agents, we want to build teams. But oftentimes we let our egos get in the way so that when we have teams and we're talking to our clients, it's like, but I'm the leader and, you know, I make these decisions and it's me, me, me or whatever. And these people work for me instead of being like, actually, my team is the best. My team is amazing and boosting your team up to support you and really shifting the mindset that like boosting your team up does not diminish you. Boosting your team up actually um actually gives you that additional clout because you're the one who hired them, trained them and got them into that position. And so what I wanted to ask you about was vendors, right? Like we work with stagers or painters or handymen or photographers in our day to day regularly. And they're like an extension of our team um, to a certain regard. Coming from your world, how would you potentially integrate those people into your marketing or work with them in a way to maybe help them push you, push you uh, or push your product? At the end of the day, the thing that I hate seeing in the online space is when people take credit, like they don't edit, they don't recognize the source of the information. So I've seen so many people online, all different verticals. We work with a lot of real estate agents uh, in the real estate space. And it's like they learn something and they like to teach it as if it was their own thought leadership. I actually think it brings more credibility to you when you recognize where it came from, because it also shows that your sphere of influence is beyond you. And so you see this from like Russell Brunson, I think does a great job to be like, 
Dream 100, he talks about it, but he always attributes it back to Chet Holmes and it's yeah. a Chet Holmes strategy. Um, when you do that, it just shows that like you are constantly yourself in a state of learning and education. And that like, like for me, like some of my best recommendations, like some, I, we have lots of amazing recommendations, but if I said everything is relying on me, then I'm limiting it to me. But when I also start to recognize the sphere of influence and then how I interpret it, one, it takes a lot of pressure off of me. Um, two, it like allows me to extend things that I find interesting to you too. And so this is kind of where like, like I always look for those win-win opportunities. There's something that you said that I want to hit on, which is team is everything to me. Um, I came from corporate America where like in a big way it was client first and then team. And what ended up happening was we burnt out the team at the cost of serving the client. My, my approach with my team and my team is now 30 people. Um, and so being at that size, I am 10 times more concerned about making sure they feel supported and up leveled. I need them to know that I have their back. Um, and that like, if I set them up for success by default, by default, they're going to over deliver for the clients because they know that they're set up for success. And so like their success, I like to share it with them. But like, for me, that's a big thing is that, um, you know, if their success was dependent on me and making me look good, I feel like I'm limiting the potential of so many things. And and this was something early on starting a business that I was just like, why aren't people taking more responsibility? Well, the big reason people weren't taking more responsibility were because, was because I wasn't empowering them and entrusting them the way that they needed to be trusted. The second that um, I gave them that trust and control to see what they come back with. They come back with ideas that I like show up and see some of the results of the team put together. And I'm like, how did you think of that? And part of it was just <laughs> trusting them and letting them step into their own zone of genius and feed into that. And so I'm a big proponent of that. With vendors, um, the lesson you have to learn is, have you heard the saying, you're only as good as your weakest link? This is my biggest breakthrough of 2024. And I'll tie this back. This is the weirdest thing is that like, even as a team, like, when you have a weak link on your team or a weak link as a third party vendor that you're working with, the best your business can be is at the standard that is set by your weakest link. And even it got to the point that for my team, we had a member on my uh, my team, this is probably about a year ago, that my chief operating officer had to look at me and say, this person was great at a certain point in time. Now they're falling behind. But what's happening is if you're tolerating and approving this behavior, then you're saying to the rest of the team, it's okay to perform at that level when we want to be world-class with all we do. Same thing with our partners. We believe Custom Box Agency is world-class. Before we had fulfillment in house, we had a fulfillment partner that wanted to be good enough. And so we had a lot of problems with fulfillment and getting our boxes out to market. So the best we could be is good enough. And I've now taken that to myself to say, even in me and the journey that I'm on this year, because it's very much like about optimizing health, if I say Mark is made up of my personal life, my professional life, and then the third category I'm going to say is recovery, like sleep, that's how we spend our lives is you spend it working on your professional career, your personal life with your friends and family, and then the other part is sleeping. If I treat my business world class, but my body good enough, the best my business can be is good enough. And so on all aspects of it, when you look at your any third party partner, any team member, or even yourself, if you really want to up level, the question I would have is, you may be a rock star in your business, but how are, how are you taking care of your body? Um, how are you taking care of your love and relationships? Are you treating them at the same standard? Otherwise, you're going to limit your potential um, to whatever your weakest link is. So that simple principle for me has been a big theme for this year. Um, but that has been, it's such a simple thing. But just attributing it to self was like the weirdest breakthrough that I had, um, which is like jumpstarted the journey that I'm on in 2024. That's such a, that's such a big breakthrough because I think, you know, so many entrepreneurs are so focused on their business, growing the business as quickly as possible. You know, their whole why and drive for the world is, is focused around their business, but they don't realize if they don't have balance in the other parts of their lives, that drive in the business can only last so long before other things around them start to crumble, right? Um, so that's, that's a huge breakthrough that you had. Also, I just want to go back quickly with the, no, learning how to lead your team in a different way as you do now. Do you think you struggled with that at first coming from corporate America? 
in terms of like <laughs> you had been led in one way and that's just how you led or did you try to be drastically different in the other way and it didn't work? Like how did you become the leader that you are today with the background in corporate yeah. America? That's such a great question. It's funny in corporate America, like uh, the world that I came from, because it's so it was so crazy. Like it, when people say I want to leave a nine to five, I'm like, why? Like you're done at five. That sounds amazing. Like, <laughs> why would you ever want to leave a nine to five? Because um, I was always in a job that like you were never off. Like Saturday, yeah. Sunday, Monday. It was like because you fly, like you are always working. And if you put in more hours over the weekend, maybe you will have time to work out before you head to the client in some random city. Um, so. Uh, I came from a world that like everyone was a really high performer and like people that were two levels below me were still operating at my level, which mean I had to operate two levels above. And so um, the worst part when I left corporate America to become an entrepreneur is I have this clock in my brain that is like when I ask someone to do a task, like in my mind, I'm like, this is a 20 minute task. And so when that clock runs out, I'm like, why is this not done? Um, and that was like a big thing of like, you know, and I'm like giving them leeway and I'm like, this is like a five minute thing. And it's taking them three days. Like, what is going on? And then I get on a Zoom and like be like, here's how to do it and knock it out like that. But like that was a mindset shift that I had to take because leaving that realm that had a very like different trained individual and then coming to entrepreneurship, which you may come across rock stars that have never been to college, have a completely different take. And I don't think you need a higher ed. Um, that was a big shift I had that was like, I thought corporate America and grad school was the way. And I'm like, when people tell me they're getting their MBA, I'm like, why? Like, explain <laughs> to me why that's something that you need to, because like, are you ready to bear $165,000 in debt and the black cloud that that brings? It's an accelerator, but there's so many other accelerators. So with it, um, I had to learn to let go a lot more. Um, the catalyst that changed everything, because I kept on saying, like, and my team is all over the US. And this was like, we started to grow heavily during COVID. Um, at the end of COVID, I made a decision that I wanted to bring my team down to Austin, where I live, um, and do a retreat. And we we're going to optimize process, but I wanted them to feel a part of the creation of Custom Box Agency and be a part of the journey. Not, here's the journey. If people feel like they created the journey, they take ownership of it in a different way. But what I did not expect to happen is when people came down and I was so scared to do it because we didn't, we weren't making a ton of money and to spend the money to fly them down and put them in an Airbnb and cover the food. Uh, like it may have been an eight to $10,000 investment at the time, which for me was like, oh my God, like a lot of money. Um, but like, if I could advise anyone, that was the best thing I ever did because when they all came down, when we started to break down our business processes, um, uh, my integrator looked at me and said, Mark, stop talking. I'm going to leave this session. Chime in if you need to, but let the team uh, facilitate this. They were able to step up and create um, the journey of how, like uh, our, our process at the time of how we deliver to clients. And the second that event ended and everyone's voice was heard and they were part of the creation of the next phase of the business, my business was not the same ever again. And so now we've gotten the habit to fly in the team um, at least twice a year or members of the team. We're, and we're probably going to up it to at least once a quarter. But the stories I can tell you of like bringing the team together and empowering them with a task. Um, one of the th tasks that I put them through was we need to generate an additional um, half a million dollars as a, just a hypothetical. We split the, my team into two groups and over the course of this retreat, they had to work in small groups to come up with a proposal on how we can generate an additional half a million dollars in the business. And it was me just empowering them. The result of that, just to show you the power of it, was one of them proposed, well, we do boxes for businesses. What about if we did boxes for employees and leveraging it through an employee retention strategy, which that recommendation um, is what got us featured in Joey Coleman's book, Never Lose an Employee Again. This is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Joey, before that even happened, somebody recommended his Never Lose a Customer Again, which is also a bestseller book that I friggin' love and bought it for my whole team. But never in a million years did I know, like I read this book and was like, this is such a great book on customer experience. But had you told me that this simple initiative would eventually somehow get me connected to Joey, it was all fluke. And then Joey to ask us to get featured in his next book. Like all this was because of my team. And some of that traction and excitement, like 
I didn't do it. I didn't have that idea, but this was about empowering the team to just see it. If I asked you a question and gave you the scenario, what are you going to come back with? And if it was nothing, it was nothing, but still to get them to think about the growth of the business was a huge, huge, and this will be in our next year, you'll see a big effort of us to say, don't just think about boxes for customer retention or customer experience. How do we also use the same story for employee retention? Man, I love that. And it reminds me of this story that Perry has said a couple of, of different times in the mastermind and it's about Tabasco. Do you remember the story? I don't know if I've heard the story. Okay, so so he had a very similar experience and I'm like, oh, it's kind of all coming together oh. like it happened for you. And basically what he said was, for Tabasco, yes. all these other hot sauce companies kept popping up and like, you know, the market ended up getting a little bit diluted with like Franks and all this stuff. And they're like, okay, well, how are we going to sell more Tabasco? And they tasked their employees. And I think it was a $500 gift card. He said that they were giving out for the person who came up with the best idea of how to sell more Tabasco. And it was like, you know, these marketing campaigns and this, that, and the other. And it was a factory worker that came and said, why don't we just make the hole bigger? So more Tabasco pours out every single Comes time. And they, they sold like 30% more Tabasco because people were running out of it more quickly. And it was like for a $500 gift card or whatever it happens to be, was the idea that generated them 30% more revenue, cost them essentially nothing to do. It wasn't a massive marketing campaign or anything like that. They just made the hole a little bit bigger. And it's like, you know, uh, sometimes we think like, you know, as leaders, we have the best idea because we have the most experience, but like we tend to overcomplicate the hell out of things. Oh, when yeah. It's like something so simple could be the, you know, the solution or the key to open the big door kind of thing. Right. So I, I love that you did that. That's such a good idea to, to get your employees involved. And you've heard the story about uh, it was Flaming Hot Cheetos, right? I don't think so. No. So Flaming Hot Cheetos. Um, uh, this is Frito-Lay, um, biggest distributor of snacks. And, um, they were making Cheetos and you know, Cheetos has the, the powder that gets all over your fingers. Yeah. Um, I think that there was an issue that, um, something happened that, uh, the powder didn't get on the Cheetos. So there's this whole like batch of Cheetos that didn't have the powder on it. And it was, uh, the janitor, the janitor who took some of this home. And there was a certain type of seasoning that I think is like, um, very classic in like Mexican cuisine. And he just blended the seasoning with it and brought it to uh, the office to, for people to try. And eventually got like the attention of like the executive on the floor who then escalated up to um, upper management. And this person that it was a janitor at Frito-Lay unlocked a solution to one of their biggest selling products. And if you can see now there's flaming hot everything across all the different verticals, multi, multi-billion dollar business that all came from one janitor that took a fluke product and brought it home. And I think there was also, I heard that story, I've read that story, and I also felt like there was a Hulu uh, series that was made off of this individual, but it just goes to show you that, and this goes back to the whole X Prize. there's a needle in a haystack anywhere. Anyone could have the idea and the solution. Um, and if we as leaders think that we have to come up with all the solutions, I mean, being humble and like just to get on calls, I can't tell you how many calls I get on now that I'm like, how did you think of that? That is brilliant. <laughs> like, um, well, I think by the team, I think the big difference that we often forget about as leaders is like, you're looking at your business so often at 10,000 feet, right? You're trying to look at every angle. You're trying to look at like, how do we make improvements? How do we make changes at such a high level when it's like the people who are in the fickle pieces of the business day in and day out are seeing opportunities that you're never going to see because like they're buried in the haystack and you're looking at the haystack from above, right? And so they're some of them are getting poked by the needle while they're in the haystack while you're standing over it. And I think that's the piece that we forget and leveraging that information and those experiences that the employees are having is what makes a the best leaders even better leaders because they're able to leverage that and the best companies succeed and come up with new ideas and constantly and constantly innovate. Um, so, and that kind of happened with you, right? You had your uh, product, which was the events and what you're doing now kind of came out of that. So how did you decide, okay, we, we did this box. It was a big success. 
I'm going all in on boxes versus continuing to run these, uh, you know, events. I'm just going all in on the boxes, which were your upsell or even your gift at one point. Yeah. Again, such a, I mean, these are all great questions. So 2019, I did that event high ticket online. I think it was May of 2019. Um, yep. And then clients started reaching out asking, like, I was like, my business is virtual events. And they're like, but these boxes. And they kept on being like, but the boxes. <laughs> and I'm like, but virtual events. Like, that's my business. <laughs> like, that's something we offer. Um, and so people were reaching out and be like, here's how you do it. And people started like hiring us to their events with the box. And so um, just started getting attention. And it got to the point that I'm like, I'm spending way too much time talking about these boxes. So I launched a product called uh, the Custom Box Challenge. And it was a five day challenge that basically walked you through how to start to think through and do these boxes yourself. And I sold it for $27 is what it was, or 37, one of the two. And so when people are like boxes, I'd be like, I just could take the Custom Box Challenge, it's all in there. Um, what ended up happening was a couple of things. One, I built the challenge publicly, meaning um, when I announced that I was doing this, I was like, be part of it and come with me. and would interview like this is another reason that like a, a virtual summit or just podcasting is great because you get to ask them whatever you want and it's like free mentorship and coaching and so i was like like these are all things that i wanted to develop and invited people to be part of the journey and so when i launched the product um we instantly had this group of raving people that were ready to buy because they went along the journey with me i didn't just dump it on them they were like part of the like launch of it and um the launch was a disaster because my computer died um like this is a brand new macbook pro fully souped up like i'm like this is my entrepreneurial computer biggest waste of junk like fully loaded brand new and um, i'm sitting in the apple store like i have a launch right now and they are looking at me like this computer is dead there's just nothing <laughs> that you could do but like that was one of the things that was so great because then they all got loud to be like, like, take my money. Like, when is the car going to open? Because they made such a buzz was I was freaking out. The reality was they activated more buyers for this challenge, which was the coolest thing ever. And so when I like launched it the next day and finally was I had to buy a new computer um, just to <laughs> launch it, um, uh, the opposite happened. People went through the challenge and they were like, we love we're the challenge. We love like what you do. Will you build our box? So the challenge was designed to like buy back my time. The challenge did the opposite. It like, <laughs> created these evangelists that started talking about custom box agency. And um, so beginning of 2020, so now we're getting into the COVID era to answer your question. I had this business that I was about to start with custom boxes and uh, this business in virtual events, COVID hit. We're all quarantined at home and um, overnight you would think that having years of doing these virtual events is a good thing at the beginning of covid because everyone's trying to figure it out but i i don't think i was as excited about it as and, and essentially what happened was everyone overnight became a virtual event expert every local market event planner wedding planner is now an expert in virtual events so this blue ocean became a bloody red ocean so i don't know if your people know blue ocean versus red ocean you're talking about something that didn't have a lot of competition versus something that is just like packed with competition. And it was my mentor. This was May 2020. Um, I was like lost puppy. I didn't know what to do. I had these two businesses that were doing OK. And um, he said, I asked a bunch of people who is Mark Stern. Half of them said um, he's the custom box guy. The other half said you're the virtual event guy, which means you're confusing people. So he's like, which one are you? Are you the box guy or the virtual event guy? And um, all signs pointed to being the virtual event guy made more sense. Um, I went out for a walk and was like, again, this is trusting your intuition. Um, I was like, I can't explain it, but there's something with these boxes that is untapped. That is not a swag box. It's not giftology that is like truly setting people up for success and killed my virtual event business to go all in on this custom box business. And that one pivot, and this is the power of pivots took an entire realm of competitors in the virtual event space to now being strategic partners because I had something that they all could utilize. And if you map out the journey, had you told me you can grow a million dollar business in a year during a pandemic, I would have said, I don't know if I could do that. Today, Custom Box Agency is still word of mouth. We've serviced so many businesses, um, but we went from zero to um, 
uh, over a million dollars in revenue the first year via word of mouth. And so the thing that's cool about it is like all it was, was owning my perspective and my strategy. Um, uh, and it was very much a game of, I see it. Do you see what I see? And do you see the impact of it? And even when the rest of the world didn't see it, all it took was one person. And for me, it was Stacey Martino of relationship development. She goes, I see it. And she became a client and we started doing it for her. And then the next person goes, I see it. And so the snowball happened that this unique perspective of like our unique value prop with boxes and how we're using it to optimize experience and bring together physical and digital in a really powerful way just started to, 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 to roll out. But like looking back, cause we have our, like, we are very strategic with how we approach things. Um, looking back, like, again, I never thought if you'd said you're going to build this box business, I would have said you lost your mind. Um, <laughs> the reality was there's no better business that brings together the history and my upbringing in terms of like my passion for strategy and like visual and bringing the visual to life in a really powerful way that I am like a, third grader in the sense of like, don't show me a bunch of words, show me pictures. I want pretty pictures and I need the pictures to sell me on like how to get results faster. Cause like just the idea of copywriting, um, like sucks the soul out of me, but the <laughs> idea of laying something out visually, um, this is why PowerPoint is my love language, um, is, um, so much more. And like these boxes get to it's so much easier for me to visually represent something um, and get you results faster um, than to give you something that's just dense text. So can you share with our audience without giving away the secrets, but I know you work with other real estate agents, but like, can you, cause like we have had conversations in depth, but like, I want people to really have a good like visual representation of like, what it is, because we say boxes, right? We haven't really got into like the finer details of it. Mm. And I think people's default is like, ah. oh, I'm going to give clients like a gift. That's oh. not what you do. No, you are way more in depth than that. Yeah, I can bring this to life for you. I, um, I want to just I want to understand, like as a real estate agent, you know, we talked yeah. about onboarding. Um, we talked about or sorry, we talked about a client acquisition, client onboarding a celebration of milestone moments. Like tell us like how, you know, cause you put several boxes uh, together from an automations perspective to like, you know, have a, a comprehensive book ended total experience. So like, how do you work with real estate agents in that capacity? So the first thing I want to tell you is when we think about like sending you something physical, what I anchor on initially is what are the things we save? So this idea of like, what are the things that we naturally save in our lives? that if you naturally save something, then how do we leverage that as an insight? So let's let's start with something really simple. Um, one of the categories I talk about is reference and remember. Um, a book, if it's in that category. When you finish reading a book, what do you think most people do with the book? Put it on the shelf. It was on the shelf. Put it on the shelf. So we know that people put a book on, on the bookshelf and sometimes it could sit on that bookshelf. I have books that have been sitting on my bookshelf for not days or months, but years or decades. And when I move, I pack them up, even though I don't go through them. So this thing is taking up space. I want to take up real estate in your house. Like I want to have a physical presence. So this idea of reference and remember, if you can see a lot of our boxes, guess how big they are. Most of them are the size of a book because okay. I want you to put them on your bookshelf. I want to brand the spine so you can see it on your bookshelf. I can build a whole anthology over this concept. So this idea of the size of the box, I know the bigger the box, the less likely people are going to save it. Uh, the, the smaller the box, we can start to emulate some of these behaviors. So that's a category. Another category is things with play and replay, replayability. Things with replayability are things we save. You don't play golf and then throw out your clubs. You don't play basketball and throw out a basketball. If we talk about board games, you don't play Monopoly and then throw out the Monopoly game after you play it. So this idea of this, my parents, my dad still has his CDs, his eight tracks, his vinyl records, even though he has no means to play his vinyl records or A-tracks, and it's kind of cool that vinyl records are coming back. But this idea of replayability, VHSs, all these things, CDs. I have my CD collection in my childhood home um, from high school. So like, it's just showing you this idea of replayability. So what do we start to think about in terms of the experience in the box? Um, do we have almost like a board game has a game board, something that they can go through that takes them from the beginning to the desired outcome, something that they can repeat again and again? Are we educating them? Hey, go through this experience once, but then in a couple of months, I want you to revisit it and go through it again. Think about books or movies you've watched. Have you ever watched a movie or listened to a song? And then years later, 
watch it again and listen to the song, but it's a whole different interpretation and experience. Yeah. That's because 100%. your environment shapes that element. So when we think of that replayability, that's a category. Um, recognize and wear awards, things that like, if you look at your real estate agent and recognize them for, um, you know, you sold five homes, you sold 10 homes, you sold a hundred homes. Um, what's really powerful about recognition is when you recognize someone, do you think they take that award and throw it out? Do you think Russell Brunson, if y'all know ClickFunnels, they have the two comma club award. Do you think people get the two comma club award and then just trash it? So things that recognize people. So a perfect example is um, if you graduated high school or college, you probably got a graduate degree or some type of physical diploma. It's a piece of paper. Like it probably costs the university like one to three dollars for this piece of paper. Yet we hold this piece of paper for the rest of our lives. So recognition is really powerful, starting to engineer that into your process. And the last one, which is my favorite, is this idea of collection. Um, if you're collecting something, we call it collecting complete. Um, when I was a kid um, in the United States, they came out with a new quarter for every state. So our 25 cent quarter, every state had its own quarter. My father and I had this map that as we collected the quarters, we would push it into this little coin board. And, um, you know, the idea of collecting, if you collect Legos, Beanie Babies, I don't know if Beanie Babies were a big thing. Oh, yeah, I got and, a huge, uh, I'm a huge collector, so I'm, I'm right with you. Like, I love all sorts of different collection items. Com comic books, stamps, um, baseball cards or Pokemon cards or whatever cards you want to play. Like, all these things, the inherent nature of collecting something you like uh you're not going to throw it out because you're collecting it so how do i engineer that from a box perspective um one of my biggest inspirations is if you've ever heard of a spartan race have you ever heard of a spartan of race mud run how do you do them yeah i used to oh man i used to now i'm getting back to it i'm doing it in um uh austin um in may because it's been like five years since i did one but when i did a spartan race like what i wanted was the medal at the end of the race. Like what I wanted was this, because this signified that if I held this medal, that I completed the race. So this recognizes that I completed it. What Spartan did that caught me off guard was they said, congrats on completing the race. Now it's time to go for what they called your trifecta. And they gave you a third of a medal. Oh, this cool. Is a friggin' brilliant strategy when we're talking about extending lifetime value because I didn't start my Spartan journey. I did it because I was like, it's a 5K, it's a sprint, I can go get it. But when I got my red piece, which is the sprint, the three to five miler, and then I was like, I wanna do another one. Then I got my second piece. Do you think I just said, I'm okay with having two of three? <laughs> Had you told me in 2015 when I did my first Spartan that I'd be doing a half marathon mud run, I would have said you lost your mind, but they created the constraints to say, I have to finish this. I have to close this loop. And so that's been a big inspiration for me and a lot of things with our businesses. How do we engineer this ourselves? Well, a perfect example is we may say, hey, here's box one of four. If you want to collect box two of four and three of four and four of four, you have to keep playing the game. And so mm. part of it is engineering it. So that is from just like a high level theory of like, how are we thinking about the things that we naturally save in our lives? And how do we engineer that in terms of what we create? Now, what goes into an experience? Um, I want to see some type of journey that you can show me. You're going to start here. And let's just say if it's a real estate agent, it could be your training process to get them to a certain level of proficiency. They can like earn their rookie rank and then eventually get a certain level and start to become more and more proficient. It could be based on the homes that they sell. It could be based on taking on and training uh, agents under them. However you gamify that structure, how do I give them the tools to build the confidence and the confidence that as they go through this process, you at least have defined what success looks like. Trifecta, the success looks like this. I have all three medals for the Spartan race. They define success. For a lot of businesses, they kind of just throw you in there, but they have not defined what success is. At the end of college, the diploma is defining success. If I have the diploma, I completed right. college. If you do a marathon, having the medal from the marathon is success. If you are in Taekwondo, having the belts, all those belts are what a million belts. Yeah. <laughs> you know that the destination of what you want is the black belt because they define black belt. Black belt had right. no meaning until they gave it meaning. Then you gave me something to strive for. The question I would have for any real estate agent is whatever process you engineer, have you given them 
have you defined what success looks like and given them the mark that actually represents what success looks like. So that's like the piece that, you know, when we're talking about getting people through, um, the idea of like a two comma club award over here is so many people in the ClickFunnels community want the two comma club award. The reality is when you have a two comma club award, that means you have a business that's generated a million dollars, a seven figure producing business that should be celebrated. But like truly what people want is the award. The award represents so much, something so much bigger. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a black belt in Taekwondo. Same thing if you want to be a Cub Scout to an Eagle Scout and Boy Scouts. I don't know if the equivalent is Girl Scouts, but like um, all of these are things that they've defined what success looks like. It's not up for debate. This is success. So that is what we're ultimately looking for is like for our customer, for our team, have we defined success in a way that it is concrete? It's undeniable that when you hold that graduate degree or that diploma, when you have that driver's license, like you are certified to drive, like it's undeniable. So those are the moments that we look for when we're talk talking about experiences that the journey that you define needs to define what success is. Um, a physical element to represent it is just a really powerful thing. I love the, you know, the, the element that you've brought in, that you've brought to it, that it's like going to be placed on a shelf. You've thought through the size that it's going to be kept. Um, you know, because even when I think about real estate, real estate brokerages have done a really good job of the recognizing the reward at different levels and getting you hooked in, right? Like they've got a level for you do a hundred K in commission in a year and then 300 K and then 500. And everyone wants that, that, you know, two comma, every brokerage calls it something different, that million dollars in a year. Right. But the, where they failed is for most of them, it's a piece of paper. And when it's only a piece of paper, I couldn't tell you where half of mine are, right? Like I even remember, like I was so proud, you know, Remax in Canada is one of the biggest brokerages. They have the hall of fame, which states you made a million, a million bucks in a, in a single year. And when I got that, I was so excited. But then when it came, it was nothing more than a piece of paper. And now I couldn't tell you where it is wow. because it's just like, it was, you know, a certificate, but it was a certificate in a little folder and it got stuffed in a drawer and I couldn't tell you where it is. So like they had the first piece, right. Of like making you race for those things. But now it's something that I don't even know. Do they have, right? a so they missed that, that element or do they just have that? Is that the highest? Is there a piece above it? Hall of fame is the highest. Hall of fame is the highest. And so the, for them. The, for them and the Hall of Fame is a million in commission. Yeah. And I just want to use this as an example because it shows you that you stop the game. Like they literally have an ending to the game, and that's a problem. Um, because with like it's true the comma club award, when you make the two comma club award, if they just said that's it, Quick Funnels just stopped customer lifetime value. You've not given them mm. something else to strive for. So what do they do? And one of the most powerful things you can do is this concept of unlock. Something else unlocks. If you ever played a video game, if you ever done something, yeah. you achieve a certain level, something unlocks. You can do the same thing in your business to say, hey, we have this special event that the only way to do it, or we have our annual event, but there's a bonus day. And the only way you can do it is you're in the Hall of Fame. So there's something that unlocks for you that you didn't have access to before. You're creating desire. But mm -hmm. ClickFunnels, what they do is you get the two comic club award. Now they say, go for the two comic club X. Guess what mm -hmm. happens? And that's a 10 million. Guess what happens when you make 10 million? They say, go for two comic club C, 25 million. Second, you make 25 million, then it's, they say it's 50, 75, 100 million. Um, I don't think anyone's hit a billion, but people are definitely close to getting closer to a billion the longer the ClickFunnels stays active. Do you think that they're going to stop the game and be like, sorry, 100 million was it? No. But then if you like, <laughs> introduce the next piece, the game goes on. Um, yeah. The second they stop that game, you stop retention to me. Yeah. The, and the interesting part too, Ryan, when you were mentioning that, I'm like, yes, we do have these predefined levels of success, right? Like we do have that in our industry. They're all standard pretty much across the board, regardless of whatever brokerage you're at. You, uh, you get something to recognize those things. But the one thing that you said though, Mark, which I think is, um, is really lacking in our industry is like those micro levels of achievement. Because listen, the market changes, people build their businesses in different ways. Of course we can get to a hundred, 300, 500, but 
mentorship or leadership or specializations within this, having taken this training or being recognized for like these little micro commitments, I feel like our industry really does lack um, in that capacity. So I love those, you know, like little kind of check marks along the way to help, you know, help complete that motivation to get them closer to the next goal. It's so powerful. So we have a framework we call the jewels, the tools and the rules. Your customer is on the journey to the jewel. That's like the desired outcome. It could be a two comma club award. This is the jewel. Um, it is our role as entrepreneurs to provide them with the tools and set the rules. So the tools are like, what do you need along the journey? So this is where a box is really powerful. I'm sending you everything you need to be set up for success. Mm. What are the rules? Rules are about minimizing chaos. Um, because if I don't define rules, so ClickFunnels doesn't send you a two comma club award because you made a million dollars. You have to make a million dollars using ClickFunnels and you have to submit for it. You have to apply for it. Mm. Those are the rules. If you don't apply for it, you're not going to get it. If you don't make a million dollars, you're not going to get it. If you don't make a million dollars on ClickFunnels, um, you're not going to get it. So like rules are about minimizing chaos, but it also creates a feedback loop in terms of how they engineered it. And so this is kind of where you can introduce multiple jewels to get to the desired outcome. I can have these incentives at different points. What I want to know is without a shadow of a doubt, have I set up my people for success? So when they start the journey, they have a clear path. So this is kind of where like what happens for a lot of businesses is they haven't defined the path. They've defined the outcome. Mm -hmm. They may have an okay onboarding process and then it's like go. And so they get lost, they get overwhelmed, they get confused and an overwhelmed person is going to give up because they feel overwhelmed. And oftentimes people don't want to feel like a failure. If I feel like a failure, and I don't feel like I'm being reinforced that I'm heading on the right track, then like if it's a customer, they may ask for a refund, especially in the refund period. Um, and people just don't want to feel like a failure. They'd rather disappear than feel like a failure. So that's kind of why like these incentives at the right junctions, it tells you a lot of information because then I can know exactly where in my process you are at. And if I know where you're at, I can help you get unstuck by providing you the tools and resources just to get to the next level. And that's it. The jewels, the tools, the rules. I like that. That is a that is a very well thought out structure or process. I, I immediately, as soon as you said that, I wrote that down. I'm like, I need to think about that for a business for sure. Yeah, and let me know. That's gonna be that's the book. That's the book right there. I love It'll it. Be the jewels, tools, and rules. So, I got one final question for you, Mark. You you know. I feel like we could go on and on here. I like want to dig into your brain yeah. for hours on hours, but I've got one final question for you because I know we do need to wrap up. Um, you yourself are very well educated, <laughs> and but you continued that education, even though like you had an MBA, you had a graduate degree from an amazing university like Duke. But you decided that I want to continue to be educated and educate myself and continue to grow. Tough question. I, I've got an MBA as well, so I know my answer. Is the education, you, your traditional education or your entrepreneurial education more valuable to you, number one? And number two, when you're looking for employees, which do you consider more important? Oh, I could care less if you have an MBA. Like for me, I'm more like, uh, when it comes to MBA, I'm like, why? <laughs> like, just tell me why. <laughs> I feel the um, same so, way. <laughs> so, uh, the cool thing is, there's no the problem that I had with like like Duke is a great school. Uh, honestly, I had the best time. I have the best friends of it. But when I look at the true value of my MBA, was it the classroom experience? I couldn't tell you one thing about my classroom experience. Oftentimes, yeah. when you're in higher ed or some type of grad program, they have to get their curriculum approved by a committee which means when you go through that process, like it's so outdated that it's just not keeping up with what's going on in AI and what's going on in social media. Cause I went and got my MBA at 2010, 12. So that was like, what is this social media and businesses were like, is this truly something for us? So people were trying to figure out what it was. So none of that was in curriculum. It was all case studies from the 1950s that was like pre-internet days. And like, like, I'm like, I don't know what the value is of this because uh, there's nothing more valuable than actual application and like doing and actually like working with people and being out in the game. So the entrepreneurial education, um, what I care about for people that I hire employees is like, what type of person are you? Are you someone that can demonstrate thinking? And this idea of demonstrate thinking is like, I give you, I ask you a question and I can see that you're thinking. Um, and the answer you provide is like, you are actually demonstrating thinking or here's a problem. 
are they just leaning back on me saying, what's the solution? Or are they actively, because my team knows, don't come to me with, what do I do? I want you to come to me with, um, here's the challenge and here's what I'm thinking about. All I want you to do is demonstrate that you're thinking. And if you can do that, even if your thinking's wrong, at least we can guide you to the right place. Um, the other thing that I would just say from an education standpoint is um, I was born in the 80s and so much of my inspiration was from my childhood and my the nostalgia of like growing up playing Nintendo and things like that. Like there are so many things from, if you ever, this is such a throwback, Mario Brothers 3 for original Nintendo that like how that game is laid out in terms of things that have inspired my business in so many different ways that like, these are things that people would say where like, you're wasting your time playing. I, I don't play a lot of video games, but like as a kid, that was so much fun that like how they used color, how they used um, the, like the incentives throughout these games, like the amount of inspiration I get, I can't, I built an entire program based off the simple fact that if you've ever played Mario Brothers 3 on original Nintendo, level one has this like plain theme and level two is the des desert level three is the water all it's showing you from a journey perspective is if i start the game in the plane so it's like a plain field and then the next level is desert when i'm in the desert i know i'm no longer in world one i'm in world two when i'm in the water i'm no longer in the desert so it's just showing me that i'm one step closer to the desired outcome that simple lesson applied back to a business is that if I can show transition as you go through different phases, like that was inspired from a video game when I, that I played when I was like six, seven, eight years old. And so the education we get from just tuning into the universe around us and the world around us, like tap into that because I can't tell you how much I've taken from a different industry and said, I see an application that's a real world business application here and leverage that to be some of the best education that I could have ever had to think through. Why was this something that was so sticky for me? Amazing. It's why we love having guests like yourself that are coming from different industries. I mean, real realtors tend to like just copy what other realtors are doing. So we love like getting insights from other entrepreneurs that are in sales and marketing that are doing totally different things. And it's, it's great that you already have realtors that are leveraging it. Um, and I think everyone can learn so much from, you know, what you've spoken on today. This was a blast. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Having Mark, me. Thank you. Appreciate you. Before we wrap, before we wrap, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, where is the best place for them to learn more about custom box agency and reach out to you? Awesome. No, thank you for that. Uh, you can go to customboxagency.com. That's our website. You can always hit me up on Facebook. If you want to reach out directly or LinkedIn, uh, Mark Stern, um, we have a Facebook group called um, Custom Box Central, if you want to do that. Um, so those are all different ways to do it. But Custom Box Agency is the perfect gateway, especially if you wanted to like learn more about you know what it is we do. Love it. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend of custom, <laughs> of custom boxes, all right? Mr. Mark Stern. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate you. your time. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you all. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. All right.